Hello, my name is Johanna Schubert. I would like to guide you through the basic interpretation of normal chest radiographs. The images seen on a chest radiograph result from the differences in densities of the materials in the body. This means that gas is going to be the darkest, and then you go through water and bone towards metal, which is going to be the brightest object on the screen. So when you look at this chest radiograph, you recognize that the so when you look at this chest radiograph, you will recognize that the most radiolucent is the gas in the lungs or the air in this uh, lung abscess. Second would be the subcutaneous fat. And then water, for example, you know, looking at the cardiac contents or the fluid in the abscess. And then much brighter is going to be the osseous structures, which contain calcium. And then finally, metallic objects, just like this uh, technician's marker. So when you look at a chest x-ray, you need to make sure that it was done technically appropriately in full inspiration with good penetration and with a patient uh, normally straight on and not rotated. If a chest x-ray is obtained appropriately in full inspiration, then you will see the diaphragm going down to the 8 to 10 ribs posteriorly and to the 5 to 6 rib anteriorly. So this is how that would look like on the lateral view. You can see the diaphragm going down to the 5th to 6th rib anteriorly and 8th to 10th rib posteriorly. If a chest radiograph is properly exposed, then you should be able to see the vertebral bodies in the mediastinum. You should be able to see the left hemidiaphragm behind the left ventricle, and you should also see the descending thoracic aorta behind the heart. Note how you can see the lung markings going all the, almost all the way out to the periphery. Now this study is underexposed. Here you lose all the details because everything is just too bright, correct? So you can't see behind the heart anymore. You cannot see the left hemidiaphragm. You can see the descending thoracic aorta and the spine is all just way too bright as well. This study is underexposed, which means that everything is just way too radiolucent meaning that you lost uh, all the detail in the lungs. It looks like the patient has bilateral pneumothoraces. You don't see any lung markings whatsoever. And then uh, now this time the heart is uh, losing its density and it's much easier to see behind it. If the patient was imaged normally straight on, then you should be able to see the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebral bodies right in the midline between the head of the uh, clavicles. Here you see two images of two different patients. The first is a normal female, appropriate exposure. The patient is straight on. You can see the spinous processes right between the clavicular heads. You can see behind the heart, you can see the diaphragm, the descending thoracic aorta. On the second image, uh, although the exposure is done appropriately, the patient is markedly rotated. Uh, the right ribs appear elongated compared to the left-sided ribs. The mediastinum appears like it's shifted over to the right side. And then on, I, can, I cannot even make out the spinous processes. Here is one of the uh, clavicular heads, and here is the contralateral side. So the typical positions that we use for chest radiography would be the PA view. This tells you the direction of radiation going through the chest, so from posteriorly to anteriorly. Lateral view. AP view, which again means that the radiation goes from anterior to posterior. This is typically done on the floor, uh, in the ICU, you know, in the emergency room. So these will be the portable radiographs. And then a lateral decubitus view, which is typically done to look for pleural effusion. On a standard PHS radiograph, the patient is positioned as such, as you can see on the film, with the shoulders rotated forward. This will move the scapula out of the view and the patient is going to be in full inspiration. So with that, the shoulder blades are moved outside of the image. They no longer project over the thorax. When obtaining a lateral view, the patient needs to stand upright with the left side of the chest, meaning the heart, the closest to the film, and the arms are going anteriorly and up out of the view. This is an example of an appropriately obtained lateral chest radiograph. The right lateral ventricle lives right behind the sternum. 
the left ventricle and the left atrium create the posterior contour of the heart. And then the main pulmonary artery lives um, here in the center of the hilum. You can appreciate the ascending thoracic aorta, the aortic arch, and the descending thoracic aorta. And then these are the thoracic vertebral bodies in the back. When we obtain a chest radiograph, the radiation comes from a point source. And um, it is divergent as it uh, approaches the film. So if you look at uh, the way an AP chest radiograph is obtained, because now the heart is actually closer to the point source, is going to appear magnified on the images. So on a portable supine radiograph, the heart is going to appear larger than it normally is. You would like the cardiac contour to be less than half the width of uh, uh, the chest. And uh, now the scapula projects over the upper thoracic uh, cavity as well, making the interpretation of lungs a bit more difficult in this region. Lateral decubitus views are actually rarely obtained for the chest. Uh, we do them sometimes when we are looking for pleural effusion that might be hiding on an AP chest radiograph and also to see if the pleural fluid is really mobile. So it will be obtained uh, in a lateral decubitus position as the image shows. And then um, here you can see the air fluid level, large pleural effusion freely layering out. Going through the normal anatomy that you should be able to recognize in a chest radiograph. Uh, let's look at the tracheal air column first. So this is the trachea in the middle. Here you can see the carina, the bifurcation, and then the right and uh, left main bronchus. Now looking at the mediastinal structures, the superior vena cava gives you this uh, faint soft tissue density to the right of the trachea. This is about the point where the superior vena cava turns into the right atrium. So you would like central venous catheters terminate about here at the cava atrial junction. This is appropriate, approximately two vertebral bodies below uh, the uh, carina. So if this is the carina, you got two vertebral bodies below, and that's about the level of the cable atrial junction. The right atrium is what creates the right cardiac border. The left atrium actually uh, lives behind the sternum and does not create a cardiac contour on a chest radiograph. The cardiac apex is the left ventricle. The left atrium actually doesn't give you an extra bump, but it's about uh, approximately here. Uh, this is the main pulmonary artery, and then uh, the aortic arch gives you this little nubbin. So the ascending thoracic aorta goes up here. This would be the aortic arch, and then you can see the descending thoracic aorta behind the heart. These images demonstrate the normal lobar anatomy. So the right upper lobe lives anteriorly and superiorly. The right lower lobe lives posteriorly and inferiorly, and the right middle lobe is anteriorly, extending from about the right atrium uh, laterally as such. On the left side, you have only an upper lobe and a lower lobe, so the upper lobe would be anterior and superior, and the lower lobe would be posterior and inferior. Now, if you think about it, if on the left side you have a long nodule that uh, is about at this level, that would be difficult to tell if that is in the left upper lobe, or is it in the superior segment of the left lower lobe? Therefore, you need the two views of the chest radiograph. And just one more slide to quickly review the lower anatomy. The right diaphragmatic dome is usually a little bit higher compared to the left because the liver lives underneath. This image depicts the bilateral costophrenic angles which are formed by the hemidiaphragms and the chest wall. Normally, you don't see the pleura. The pleura is incredibly thin. Uh, however, the pleura becomes easily visible if there is some pleural disease, such in this case, you have a pleural effusion, which outlines the major fissure and the minor fissure. Incidentally, this patient also had a median stenotomy and valve replacement. One more example showing you small bilateral pleural effusions. Uh, both on the AP view and lateral view. This patient also underwent median stenotomy and cabbage. And just for fun, I'm showing you guys the azigos vein, which uh, pulled the pleura down with itself in this case and created this azigos lobe. So here you are seeing actually four layers of pleura coming down towards the azigos vein. And so this is not a long nodule. 
Soft tissues can obscure the lung bases, especially if the patient is uh, markedly obese. In this case, uh, you just see normal breast tissue bilaterally, which makes the lungs look more opaque and the lung bases. Note how the lung more inferior to the breast tissue appears much darker. Overlying lucencies can also make it difficult to interpret the underlying lungs. So this first patient has extensive chest wall emphysema, which makes it a little bit harder to see that there is a pneumothorax at the left base and uh, it's very hard to comment on the lungs. The second patient has extra, extra densities. So these are bilateral breast implants, which again obscure the underlying lungs. The ASU structures that you need to be aware of um, on a chest radiograph are the thoracic vertebral bodies. We already talked about the spinous process in the middle that you commonly see. And then uh, these are the clavicles, clavicular head bilaterally. And then uh, here we are looking at the ribs posteriorly. And then uh, these are the ribs coming down anteriorly. Scapula at the back. And oftentimes you're going to see the humeral head as well.